Welcome to the latest episode of County Conversation, the cricketer's brand new podcast. Still quite new. Three episodes in, I'm still going to keep brand new in there, covering all things UK domestic cricket. The show is weekly and we will lift the lid on county cricket and feature me, your host Cameron Punsonby, and a selection of the cricketer's award-winning team. Today, we have a return for chief correspondent and man off to Manchester City versus Real Madrid this evening after this show, George DeBell. Welcome, Hello. George. Hello. Nice and a surprise you. recall for digital editor Nick Housen, who is replacing a diseased Nick friend, so he cannot be on the show today. Nick Housen, welcome. Yeah, difficult decision to recall myself, but um, you know, I got made a late, came for a late fitness test. Um, unfortunately, a uh, friend was sidelined. So, you know, delighted to be here. Perfect. Like for like. And our guest this week <laughs> is a bowler with 270 test wickets for the West Indies. He was part of Surrey's back-to-back -back championship winning teams. It is, of course, Kimar Roach. Kimar, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, man. Nice to have me here. Cheers. Well, firstly, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's your fourth straight summer with Surrey. And if you don't mind me saying, you are... You're 35 years old now. I don't want to bring it up too much. If I was 25 years old, I know, and I'm signing for Surrey, I'm going to the Pear Tree Cafe, I'm going to Cafe Soul, I'm going to Northcote Road, I'm, no, I'm going to the ship in Wandsworth. I think far too much of you to think that that's where you're frequenting in South London in the weekends. What is it that keeps you coming back to South London? How's your time in the, in the, in the area? What is it about, yeah, the team and the setup there that keeps you coming back? No, no, I'm happy to be part of the Surrey setup. I think it's one of the most relaxed setups I've ever been in. Um, from the coaching staff, from obviously from Alex Stewart, the director, and his staff, and then the coaching staff, and then the players in the dressing room. They've done a fantastic job in keeping me comfortable, man. Um, and the environment is a very relaxed one. It's a hardworking one, but the communication and everything around is so relaxed and it's so clear and there's such good clarity that it's an enjoyable setup to be in man. obviously it's a very winning and high professional setup so i always bite myself on coming back here and putting my best foot forward and helping win games with siri and two back-to-back -back champions is a pretty good little tick on the resume can i jump in here or already is that okay of course, Akeem, that. almost every other top international player you know what i'm going to ask already is making a living, a, a good living, in the T20 leagues. They're bowling four overs a couple of times a week and playing in hot countries. You've come to England, you've got to bowl 20 <laughs> over spells with a kookaburra ball, risking frostbite. You, you, what, what, you're mad for red ball cricket, aren't you, really? But what, what is that about? You, what, what has taken you down that path? Um... That's where I started, basically. Um, I'm not going to lie, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. The older you get, the harder it is for you. But I think the love for the game is 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 what keeps me going. Um, I just love red ball cricket. I love the challenge of it. I love the change of conditions. I just love the the whole, the back and forth and the ups and downs of the four days or the five days or whatever you play. So I understand, yeah, the, 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 the franchises and stuff is quick, easy money, quick, short, short tournaments that is, is much easier on your body, but I'm chasing a legacy. I'm chasing something that I want to. I want to etch my name in the stone for for Red Ball cricket for years to come. Obviously, as one of the leading West Indies fast bowlers of the of the new age, you know. So it's it's tough. I'm not lying to you. It's tough. Obviously, England is not ideal conditions for me coming from Barbados, but I think, as I said, play for Surrey and the amount of great guys we have in our group. It just it's just a refreshment of coming back here and just being able to step on the field and play some red ball cricket again. Do you, do you think you might be the last of that generation that that puts red ball cricket first? Uh, however much young players might really love it, it's so hard to turn down the the T Twenty money, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard. Um, if I had opportunities to, I, I'm sure I would obviously look into that too. But, um. I don't know if I'm the last generation. I hope not. I hope not. I think there's still a big play for Test cricket. And you can see the last couple of Test series have been exciting. And there's still there's still a buzz around Test cricket. And obviously, there's there's some changes that need to be had. 
um, in terms of help boosting that, helping guys, the younger guys, obviously, to, to obviously further their careers in red ball cricket. But I think hopefully I'm not the last generation to 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 to, to pursue a 300 or a 400 test wicket career. So I'm hoping to, hoping for the best. Actually, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for the best. How is the kind of county championship? When you're having conversations with your kind of international teammates or teammates back in Barbados, are you talking about, is the talking the change rooms there? Like, how can I get a deal at the the 100? How can I get a deal in the big bash? Like, is there ever conversations with when you're have, talking to kind of the lads back home about how can I get a red ball deal or has the white ball kind of priority kind of taken over to that effect? Yeah, white ball taken over. Like, more taken over. Obviously, people have understand that cricket is a short career, so people try to maximize it financially. I understand that. I do get a few guys asking about a county contract or a second contract in corner cricket or whatever, but um, there's way more guys looking to play the white ball franchise stuff. And I'm not lying to you, it's understandable. It's understandable. Every, you want to be able to go to the supermarket and buy some groceries and, you know, and not have to worry about yourself. But as I said, it's what you want from your career. And as I said, I started playing robot cricket. I fell in love for it. Um, and I just want to be amongst the great names of West Indies, the Curtly Ambrose, the Courtney Walshes, um, the Malcolm Marshalls, and Andy Roberts and those guys. I just want to be amongst those names. And obviously those names, they've, they've stopped playing 30, 40 years now, and they're still remembered. I want to be remembered like them as well too. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm searching for. And kind of, as we've mentioned here, you're prioritising test cricket at a time where where other people aren't and i know i'm, I'm not going to ask you to say like uh you get frustrated when like jason holder misses a series or when individuals miss series but there must be an element of frustration directed somewhere um and kind of where where is that kind of frustration directed to because you're, as you said you understand individuals experiences if i'm playing a club game on a saturday i understand why someone misses a game for a wedding but i'm still annoyed they're missing it like it's obviously the stakes are much higher in the world you're ex existing and playing in, where can you complain to? What is, do you feel like you're just kind of shouting into the void or is there a chance that you guys, you feel like you can enact some change? Um, I think the ICC, the governing body, they can do way more for test cricket. Um, I think they're letting it die. And I don't know why. I think financially they can, they can influx some more money into it. I think that will keep the interest of a lot more guys because Let's be honest, it's 2024. Financial gain is, is what most guys are looking for in this, this day and age. And if you can influx some more money into test cricket, uh, especially the smaller countries, we all know the England, the Indias, the Australians, they get the bulk of the money. But I think the smaller countries, the ones that actually have a passion for it, I think the ICC can, can, can restructure something and just put some more money into the smaller countries. Um, better, better. Um, match fees and all of these those sort of things we're going to help people to to commit more to red ball cricket and keep it alive we, we've witnessed too many great test series too many great test matches to just let the cricket like that die i think test cricket is a pure form of cricket and i think the icc has a big big part to play in terms of helping the smaller countries be more interested in it Kima, I wonder if you could give us a, an insight from sort of the overseas perspective as to how the county championship is kind of perceived as a competition, um, its quality, and, and what's to be gained by having stints playing in that competition. Yeah, I think the county cricket is, for me, uh, I've never played in Australia. I've never played for a cricket in India. But for me, I think coming to county cricket in England, I think, it's the closest form of cricket to test cricket. Um, and me being a test cricketer, I need to be challenging myself in order to be, to be obviously on a peak in my test cricket or my cricket career. So coming here, play for Surrey in a professional setup. Obviously, the, the facilities are amazing. Um, the organization is amazing. There's, there's, there's heaps of physios, massage therapists. There's you no know, leaps and bounds of everything you need to do. To, to keep yourself in good shape and obviously going to county grind. So for me, I, I rate the county cricket, the championship, like highly. I think it's very challenging. The weather plays a big part of it, then the rain, and then there's every day could be a possible different condition. And I think that's what makes it so exciting. Um, 
like the last game there for us, uh, I think we try to chase 200 runs and 20 overs. That's mm. that's the fun about corner cricket. You can you can go slow for two days and then the second, the third, and the fourth day can be a quick pace. And I just love that form. I just love that 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 challenge. And I'm I'm willing to play four day as long as my body can hold up to do that. If there's one thing that we know, sorry for as well as you know, obviously being well resourced as you highlighted there is is the production their pathway system. I wonder which which players particularly stand out for you, uh, particularly the younger players um, at the moment. No, well, from a body perspective, definitely Jamie Smith. I think when I first came to the club, um, he was playing seconds cricket, and there was always a buzz about him. Um, I didn't get a chance to see much of him. A little couple of sessions at practice, but seeing him now is, I can tell he's a drastic and a big improvement he has made in his career. And I've seen him in the one day, I think he played one days for England last year. And I think he can be or will be the future, you know, England white ball batting. I think he's highly talented. He's a very confident young man and he imposes himself on the game. I love that about a youngster. So. He's very expressive, and I think he has the ability to to, to take it to the to the highest level um, for English batting. And from a bowling perspective, I think Tom Laws. Tom Laws had a fantastic season last year, but he also, when he first came to the club, he was a part of the second team. And to see him transition to the first team now, and the way he bowled, especially last year, there's a lot of maturity. Um, he has good pace for, for, for a young guy, and I think he's very skillful too. And he works really hard. He asks a lot of questions. He comes to me, asks a lot of questions. He's probably my best mate in the dressing room. So I think those two guys, from from a perspective of what I've seen, I think they're on great course to being the next England stars. Can I just ask you what what are kind of twenty year old Tom Laws and thirty five year old Kim Rich? What are you bonding over? What what what's, what's the mutual interest <laughs> where that that friendship is formed? Just, just bowling, basically bowling. Um, yeah, he's a very curious young guy. He, he he obviously wants to learn as much as he can, and that's good. You don't want to take too much information on board. You just want to express yourself and enjoy your cricket. But I think he's he's willing to learn and he's willing to improve, and that's that's good signs from a youngster. And he's very focused. He comes to cricket. He works hard. He does his job, and I think when he gets a chance to play. He puts a lot of effort in. So I think yeah, he. He's a really good guy to be around. Man. He's funny also, and um, you know, it's, it's just good to have him around and be around the youngsters as well. Like, it makes you feel young within yourself. <laughs> I, did, I, I get that. I, I get that with Cameron. Um, <laughs> Damn. What about opposition players who, who you've uh, come up against? I saw Tom Lamanby uh, got runs against you last week, who, who uh, I think is uh, really promising. Is there anyone who's impressed you in, in opposition sides? Um, yeah, Lambi is one of them. Um, it's the first time I played against him last week. I think he's set up very well. Um, yeah, he has a good base and I think he has a bright future as well. He's a very, he's an elegant player. He's very easy on the eye, has a lot of time to play the ball. I think he is definitely one to look for. Um, just trying to think now, and there's hardly much, hardly been much, guys, but. I'm more focused on the Surrey guys. I don't really focus on the opposition. <laughs> but, that's fair. That's fair. But, yeah, yeah, been getting out. What's that? I was saying Surrey's been getting everyone out. That's why no one's impressing you. So like, oh, they've all got 20. <laughs> no, it gets to me. Now, some guys have scored the runs against me too. So, but I can't really recall right now. Fair enough. Um, you know, obviously you've had a long career. Uh, all sorts of things in it. Um you know, played the IPL way back and all these things. But I just wondered where that Brisbane test rates in terms of your entire career. Because I can tell you that we were, uh, I was watching England in Hyderabad at the time and every journalist in the press box was gathered around screens watching that game uh, as the England-India test was also coming to an end. And it was, uh, I don't know, it was captivating hour or size cricket, wasn't it? No, it was electric. It was. Um, that's probably one of the best test matches I've played in. Um, obviously, going to Australia is, is always going to be a tough tour. Um, I don't think much things beat Australia in Australia. Um, and the very strong, strong battle lineup, very strong bowling lineup, very strong team all around. I think 
to go to Australia at a very young side. A lot of guys who has played less than 10 first class matches. Some guys probably play one or two tests, if so much. It was a very young side, and obviously a lot of talk was going around before the series started. Um, but I thought the way we handled ourselves on the field, um, the first test, yes, we got beaten. But I thought to bowl out Australia in Australia is, is was a, was a, was a good feat from a bowling perspective with a young bowling lineup. Only me being the the senior bowler, um, and then obviously the Brisbane Test match was it was there. It was amazing. I think Shamar Joseph he showed his class. Um, you know, probably one of the best debut series you're ever going to see. And but he bowled quickly, man. He he really set the gab on fire, and his energy his energy was electric. And it went straight to the team. And now he's definitely one for the future. He's at IPL now, but hopefully he can he can stick around for Red Bull cricket some more. I think he has a lot to offer, and he can build a really big career if he if he commits to that. But I think. That Brisbane test is probably the one of the best tests I've ever played it. Whenever England, it seems to me anyway, whenever England come to the Caribbean to play test cricket, there's always a lot of talk about West Indies aren't quite the side they were and all the rest of it. But I don't think you've ever been beaten by England, in your career, ever been beaten by England in the Caribbean, have you? No, I've never lost a series to England <laughs> in the Caribbean. <laughs> and had some. There have been some terrific games. I mean, the 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 result in Barbados not so long ago, Antigua as well. I don't know. Are, are there any particular memories stand out from those series? Um, definitely the Barbados tests. Um, uh, when Jason Holder scored a double, that was in 2019, I think it was. Um, that yeah, that I think it got five because that test match as well. I think we dominated England that that test series. Um, that was probably the most committed and the most focused I've seen the team. Um, we obviously know that England is our biggest series. England at home in the Caribbean is our biggest series. And we just want to keep that history. I don't think we've ever lost a test series to them in 50 years at home. I think so. It could be wrong. Um, yeah, but, I, think there was, I think there was one, you know, the, the Steve Harmison series in, in yeah. whatever year that was, but 2007-ish, yeah. something like that. Yeah, something oh. like that. Yeah. So... I just think that we just wanted to keep that that history going um, and let them know that England, when they come to the Caribbean, it's going to be tough cricket. Um, but definitely the, the test match in Barbados, where Jason scored a double and we gave in the late 600 runs to win those last innings. And Rawson got eight wickets in the second innings as well. So that that test match stood out most for me because I'm, I'm from Barbados and playing at home in front of your home crowd, in front of your friends, that definitely was the best win for me. Just, just love it couple of questions on, on Shamar Joseph one like when he turns up in Australia did, when did you find out who he was like did you did you know did you know him personally um and when he starts bowling you're like how much of a surprise was how well he performed because I think for the rest of the world yes he played a bit in the CPL but like he lit his his ascent to the top is as kind of quick as I think anyone can recall yeah I honestly I've I haven't heard of him. When I, when the team was selected, obviously <laughs> Craig, Craig being the Craig being a captain, we have a good communication. Craig came to me, he told me the team. I was like, who's this guy? I don't know him. I've not seen him. And there's a lot of buzz about no one has seen him. He hasn't played first class cricket. And there's they don't know. But there's a clip, there was a clip of him on CPL. He bowled pretty quickly. Um then he went to an 18 tour in South Africa before the Australia tour, and yeah. he got a chance to play. He got five wickets on debut. So the talk was like, Yeah, well, that basically got him into the team. Some guys pulled out and they were looking for a fast bowler. He was one of the quickest going around. So they selected him. So when I turned up to Australia, I, I just tried to help him. I was like, You know, it's going to be a tough series. It's always Australia, it's going to be a tough series. It's just about enjoying your cricket, expressing yourself, and having fun. Don't worry about the result. It's your first tour. Just do what you can, the best you can. And he just surprised everyone, basically, even me. <laughs> Is it Has that happened to you before, where you've seen a name on a West Indies squad list and you, you genuinely didn't know who the blue, bloke was? A couple of times. A couple of times. <laughs> um, I think I think we, we have a lot of changes in our team every series. Um, 
And that's probably one of our downfalls too. There's no there's no solid platform or base for us in terms of our team. It's always a chop and change and it's always hard to like to, to set your, your team up or obviously the equilibrium and everything about it, the structure of it when people keep coming in or out. But that's just how our cricket is. And I've I've seen a few names I've not known before, but they've came in and they've acted professional, they've done the job. For, for a period of time and you know i guess that's the way we just go about our cricket you just take a risk here and there perfect we're gonna how, George, how, your how, question. yeah i, I yeah. well whether well, that's right how much longer can you can you can you go Kimo? How, how many because uh, what, what you you basically are playing about six or so tests a year on average isn't it um is there anything in mind for you or is it just um going as long as you can really Basically, just going as long as I can, man. That's that's one of the, the the hurtful things about it. Um, obviously, at the end of your career, you want to play as much to get to the goals you want to achieve as fast as possible, and letting that guy come in. And I really want to achieve training test wickets. It doesn't make sense working so hard to get so close and then giving up. So I'm gonna go as long as the selectors let me, and as long as my body holds up. But my goal is definitely to try to get training test wickets. Unfortunately, we don't play enough test cricket. We play six tests. A year, um, play two tests, two test matches every six months. <laughs> it's not, it's definitely not ideal. Um, but you know, you just keep thinking positive. You come to Surrey, I come to Surrey, I just keep myself fresh, coming as a good uh, professional setup and work hard, keep my body in good shape. And for me, at 35 years old, I need to keep playing. I can't take a break and come back. It's gonna be hard for me to come back to reset. So it's about me keep playing keep my body in good shape, keep ticking over, and then hopefully I can get these training test wickets. And... Is 100 tests within reach? No. <laughs> really? Well, I just wondered whether you looked at Jimmy Anderson, and I know he's a, he's a freak, isn't he? But yeah, he's he six years older than you. <laughs> or something. You know, the best part yeah. of six years older than you. Yeah. He's still terrific. He's still fit. Is that an inspiration? Of course it is. Of course it is. I think it's an inspiration for everyone. I think you know, back in the days, everyone said, by the time you get 30, and if you're not of a high standard, teams try to get you off the team to get the new guys in. But Jimmy has not broken has not broken that barrier to show people that at 38, 39, 40, 41, you can still be performing at a high level once you keep your body fit. If if you're a good if you're a good boy, if you're a good batsman, you're gonna be better at 38, I reckon. You're gonna you're gonna play more, you're gonna get more experience, and then you know you can just keep Keep performing at a high level so jimmy has definitely changed the whole thinking of of the of, of age in terms of when a guy should retire because when they first came into the team everyone said 35 is the age that most guys retire now chris played at 40 shiv and shannon paul played at near 40 and now jimmy Brobs at 38 i think it was well that otis did... gibson was about 40 wasn't he he was playing yeah there you go so so yeah i think there's still room for guys if their bodies are in good shape and they're still performing at a high level, just let them play. I don't know why people try to push them out because of age. If they're good, let them play. It, it sounds like in the last five minutes you've convinced yourself that it's possible. That it's possible. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a hundred <laughs> tests is easy. Yeah, it's only another, what is it, three, four uh, years? Easy. It's a possibility, but I'm not sure, man. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. The Kookaburra experiment is over for now. Alex Stewart, Kimar's director of cricket, said it was the worst idea ever. And England managing director Rob Key thought it was the best idea ever and that he'd like to see English cricket use it, quote, all the time. All nine matches were drawn in round two, just the third time in history that's happened. There were 27 centuries. Warwickshire scored 698 for three. There was some good cricket. Cameron Steele is the leading wicket taker in the Cavs Championship. And Kimar Roach took one for in the match against Somerset. So, Kimo, does that mean are you team anti Kookaburra? What, what's what's the go? What, what's happening? What is the chat within the Surrey dressing room? Is the fact that Alex Stewart said it's the worst idea ever? Is anyone allowed to disagree with him? No, nah, I'm not allowed to disagree with him. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, no, I think no. He has a valid point. Um, I guess he has his reason for saying that. I, I'm a cricketer. Kookaburra ball, SG ball, Duke ball. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to try my best to get wickets with any ball. But to be honest, the Kookaburra ball, 
it, it, it doesn't stand the test of time. Um, the issues we've had for the last two rounds were it went soft very quickly. And as a fast bowler, it's not, you're not going to get much out of the pitch of a softball. Um, it loses its shape. There's not much of a scene. And you can see the results in the first two rounds. A lot of, a lot of hundreds have been scored. A lot of runs have been scored. And I think, I don't know if it's a future. <laughs> I don't know if it's a future. I started playing test cricket with Kookaburra balls in the Caribbean. And we transitioned to juke balls, and then cricket has become more exciting. Um, runs are still scoring, and guys are getting wickets too. So cricket has become has has speed up, and has become more exciting. So I think the duke ball has done that. I have not played much cricket with the SG ball, but for me, I think the duke ball is the best format. Is the best way to, to is the best ball to use for the, for the format because it makes it more exciting. My it makes cricket play a little faster. Honestly, the last game against Somerset, the pitch was slow, the ball was soft. It was hard to get batsmen out. And Cam and Dan Lawrence put in a very big shift for us, and they bowled extremely well. Put us in a position to obviously try to win the game. But I think from a bowling perspective as a fast bowler, the Kookaburra ball is a tough ball to, to, um, to bowl with. I've played with it in Australia, but the pitches are harder, and there's much more grass on the pitches. So... You still, you're still in the game. You still feel that, yeah, the Kookaburra ball is good enough. But I guess in the in, in the UK where it's softer pitches, the moisture is in the ground a lot more, and the ball just goes soft. There isn't much of there isn't much of effort or much of a uh, you know reception from the from the, from the Kookaburra ball. I've got a question for George and Nick. To be fair, does does this does this go back to kind of what the purpose of the county championship kind of is? Like, is it is it for teams to win? Is it for teams to entertain fans, or is it to produce international cricketers? Because the argument from Rob Key's perspective is, well, you've got lads scoring double centuries. That's a good thing. You've got spinners bowling more overs a spin. That's a good thing. We've got lads who bowl seventy two mile an hour, not nicking everyone off. Now, uh, you can make an argument that's a good thing. Uh, George, where do you fall on that? I think your kind of team, Team Dukes, Team Dukes is where you are uh, kind of fly your flag. Well, is, think... is it not right? I think the Dukes is a better ball. I actually completely agree with Kimo. I think uh, in most conditions, it creates more exciting cricket. On a basic level, and I don't think this is talked about very much, I just think it's round. And I'm not sure how round the Kookaburra is. Do you know what I mean, Kimo? It, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, stuck yeah. together. And it's not... Anyway, uh, I think it's more of a balance between bat and ball, but we got it wrong. I can understand why they have embraced this experiment. But to be honest... And so to answer your question, there's a balance, isn't there? It has to be about creating England players, test cricketers, fine. That's definitely a key part of it. But it isn't just an academy or a net. It's also there to entertain and uh, and create competitive cricket. To, it, it matters in itself. And I'm afraid some of the cricket, and I say this as a cricket geek, was quite dull. I'm afraid in in recent days, and it's not just the ball; it's a combination of things. It's and it's no fault of the ground staffs. The wickets are really soft because it's bloody winter, basically. And it, it, <laughs> oh, it, the combination for me hasn't worked. And actually, while it has brought a spin into the game, and that's great, it's more because there's not pace is almost a bad thing because it allows the batters the chance to score runs. So there, it's not really going to help develop fast bowlers there's no I did the game at Edgbaston and I swear to you Dale Stain, Richard Hadley, Malcolm Marshall, Imran Khan they would not have liked that wicket they would not have got stuff out of that wicket it, it's can, not can I, good for cricket. Can I ask a question you, you and Kimar just nodded and agreed the ball's not round what, what are we talking about here surely the cricket <laughs> ball is round the cooker like, I do, well Kimar do you want to take you know, what, you know what, George I'm not George you're I'm, not allowed I've to answer I've never said one, that Kimar. in public before I don't think I would. I wish I had one. I do. I've got a Dukes and a Cookaburra in here somewhere. Sorry, I, why are we listening to you, George Kimo? You're, you're a professional <laughs> bowler. Can you? What? What? What is George talking about? Is the Cookaburra ball not round? I think both are round. <laughs> but it's, it's but George. I think, <laughs> I think are we, are we the flat ball society here? <laughs> we are the, the Cookaburra ball loses shape more though. Okay, it, so the they Cookaburra... definitely lose shape faster. Okay, so it's not like from out of the box, 
there's the kookaburra is like an yeah i think or an octagon, within basically. 30 within 30 overs yeah you're probably gonna look to change the ball because it's gonna okay. be oblong yeah and in and, and you're gonna it's gonna go soft so that's where the problem goes with the kookaburra ball okay i'm i'm i'm, I'm relieved to have cleared that up because i was very confused <laughs> for a second I was, I was nodding along pretending i knew what was happening uh but i don't, I don't at all nick do you, do you have a, a, a if we're going to start debating about whether the ball is round or not, we should really get Matthew Letizia <laughs> in to try and clarify some of the finer points around this. Um, I think, think, yeah, I think the points around what what is this for and what is the county championship for, I guess, is, is kind of a wider point on this. Um, is it to develop the best England team possible? And that's the most important thing. I think I imagine there are some... Uh, chief executives and head coaches who don't give a stuff and just want to win and want to win promotion and stay up, etc. And and they might look at a rule that's been posed upon them and think that that might be contradicting that. Um, the spinner thing is an interesting one as well. Like we talked about, is this developing fast bowlers? It might also be hurting them a little bit as well. And I guess spinners kind of help to mitigate that. Um, I think ultimately we might look at this eight pool, these eight pool rounds, and go well. It's added to the data, but what is the data really relevant? I was speaking to Mickey Arthur. Yeah. Actually, didn't really re really want to talk about Kookaburra, but he brought it up and he said that like we shouldn't be using it in April. Like it's the the, pit, the conditions aren't going to be particularly helpful. And I remember a, help, a quote from Sam Cook before the season started, before he took his his ten for and his hat trick in the opening round, um, delivered the only win so far that we've seen this season. He said that. You know, yes, the kookaburra is relevant and all this, but actually the pitches I play on are going to be as relevant to me how well I how well I do and how well I perform as anything else. And unfortunately, we've had this perfect storm, literally, where pitches really haven't been fit for purpose um, as far as that's concerned. There's no blame attached really to the ground staff. Um, they've been mostly covered. Um, and that's made things really, you know, I think that's exacerbated the issue here. I think it's really good that we're talking about it, and I think it's really good that that we're developing, potentially trying to develop different skills among players. But maybe I think we might reflect, as George has said, that the cricket hasn't been particularly entertaining, and and ultimately it's 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 helped to deliver just just one result and a, and a, a deluge of runs, despite what Rob Key may or may not say. On on the on the spin front, and last one before we move on to the listening questions, um, Kima, something that I think really nice about the fact you've been at Surrey for so many years and you touched upon it there with Jamie Smith and Tom Law seeing them develop one of the beneficiaries of the kookaburra ball has been Cameron Steele and I don't think it's offending anyone to say I think people are surprised he's the leading wicket taker in the county championship after two rounds uh having seen him progress like how surprised how pleased are you to see the kind of player he's become I don't this wasn't in the scripts for Cameron Steele when you probably first met him that he was going to be Surrey's kind of leading leg spinner the leading leg spinner in the country um, honestly, people are surprised, but I'm not because nice. I've been at Surrey now for four seasons and Cam works extremely hard. People don't see it, um, but he's a very, very, very hard worker. He is one of the better guys in the, in the, in the dressing room as well. He's always a positive thinker. He always wants to help, wants to do more in terms of helping the team to get a result or whatever. I think. I think him being a leader wicket taker, I, he he bowled an extremely good spell at Lancashire um, in the first round. I think he got that's the quickest five wickets I've ever seen, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a short space of time. He just came on and, and within six overs he got five wickets or something. And then he's he he put in a big shift in the last round against um, Somerset. But I think he's been consistent. He's been having good conversations with the bowling coach. I'm seeing him in the nets. Working on his game, obviously developing the googly and obviously the slider and stuff, and we've seen it come out in the game. That means he's confident in his skills, and I'm not even surprised that he's leading right now. And the ball has, has definitely suit him. The pitches have spun just enough for him, and he's been consistent. He's been very good for us, and I think he can play a big part going forward in this season. Time to finish with some questions. We put out the call for some listener questions. And you guys have answers. If you do want to get in touch with the show and have questions for our cast of Cricketer Journalists or our guest, then please do get in touch on Twitter at the Cricketer Mag or anything longer can be emailed to website at thecricketer.com. The first one, unsurprisingly, 
is for Kemal Roach. It's from Om Omar Khan. Uh, first of all, you've already said Shamar Joseph, so you're not allowed to answer with him. Who are the Windy's fast bowlers to watch out for the future? And once you're answering that one, the follow-up is, uh, is Courtney Walsh or Curtly Ambrose. Who's your favourite? First one's first. What bowlers to look out for for the future? Um, there's a few guys coming through. Um, I think there's still big hopes for Shamar Holder. He played one test match in, in New Zealand, I think. That was in 2021, 20, could be right. Um, he played one test match and he got an injury. He, he came over here and played for Warwickshire. I didn't have a good goal, but I think he got a little injury and he's back and he's, he's he looks fit again. He played a couple of games for Barbados. He's trying to find himself, but I think he still has a big future for West Indies cricket. Um, there's also a young surf that played on 19 World Cup, Isaiah Thorne. Um, he plays for Guyana in the first class comp, and he looks he looks like a good prospect as well going forward. Um, there aren't much, to be honest. I think we're still a little bit shallow in the covers for for some fast bowlers, but I know there's there there's there's some development coaches coming into the Caribbean in, in terms of helping develop more younger players. So hopefully that. That can work and the camps and the academies that are put on by the rest of the cricket board can definitely put some more names in the hat and you can have you can always have a four a four prong bowl attack for rest of the going forward um can, can but, I jump in? Oh, sorry yeah, sorry right. go ahead. Um, um, oh, no, i was just going to ask about how people in the caribbean feel particularly in barbados feel about those players who who kind of I was going to say poached, but it's the wrong word. It's definitely the wrong word with Jofra, because I think Jofra always had a British passport, and you know that that was his uh, pathway. Uh, but but there are other players, aren't there? Uh, Chris Jordan, is it Shea Simmons? Uh, so your players there are different ages, probably five years between each of them or more, and and you've lost all of those from Barbados and West Indies. Uh, I, I imagine there's, you know, you, you wish them well personally, but at the same time, it's weakening Barbados cricket, West Indies cricket, isn't it? Yeah, I would say slightly. Um, yeah, we lose some players, lose some quality players. Obviously, Jofa and CJ being the most the most quality we've lost. Um, yeah, it 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 doesn't it doesn't say well for our cricket. I think we should be. We should be focusing on keeping these guys in the Caribbean, obviously helping these guys develop and then making them play for West Indies and develop our cricket and develop our game. But obviously these guys have, have opted to play for other countries and they've done well for themselves. They've done extremely well. So it is, there's, there's no, I understand they're probably looking for betterment of their career and they found it in the UK. But, but as a West Indian and, and a Barbadian, it doesn't say well for cricket to lose cricketers. We don't have a lot of cricketers. Let's be honest. Um, the quality of cricketers in the Caribbean aren't that high, and that's that's a, that's a, that's a fact. And to improve that, to get guys to be better, you need a, a stronger system, a stronger a stronger first class cricket, a stronger cricketing season, in terms of more quality players and more games, on better pitches and better facilities, in order to take our cricket to the next level. And I think we've been stagnant in that for as long as I've played. I've played 15 years for West Indies, 15, 16 years. And the way I've started is the same way I am right now, 16 years after. And I think that more focus needs to be on developing our facilities, developing our pitches, developing our cricket on a holistic level. In terms of producing better cricketers, more more match winners more world beaters and then we can challenge the the, the australians and the indians and the englands more you know it's going to take a lot of work we are we are, we are far off i'm not going to pretend we we win our matches we have our special performances because we are highly talented but to sustain it is going to be extremely hard because we don't play enough and we don't play high quality cricket so that that for me is where is where i'm, I'm, I'm disheartened about our cricket at home but we can't afford to lose any more cricketers. We can't afford to. Does this come down to finance? And does this come again 
as you've said previously, as Jason has said so eloquently so many times, there's a desperation, a call for the ICC to provide more funding to, to change the uh, distribution model. Is, is that the key? That, that can help. I definitely think that can help. But that is only one part of it. I think the whole structure needs to change too. Yeah, the finances will help change the structure. But I think we need to improve our facilities. I'll be honest with you. I don't think there is one endurance facility in the Caribbean. That's the honest opinion. I don't think so. But obviously, the, the, the World Cup now will probably change that. You'll get a couple because ICC has stipulations and requirements for the grounds or whatever. But at this present moment, I don't think there's one indoor facility in the Caribbean. A good one. But that, that comes down to money, doesn't it? That comes on the finances, yes. That comes on the finances too. But I think the pitches too need to improve. Every year, our first class season, the top of the charts are spinners. The top of the charts are spinners. We are not developing fast bowlers. We're not producing fast bowling pitches. And by producing fast bowling pitches, then you're going to produce batsmen that can play fast bowling. If they bat fast bowling more often, they will get better at playing fast bowling. So we are just not thinking our cricket properly. And we've said these things for years. Nothing has changed. And I just think that we need to submit to, to spend more time and more focus on improving our structure to make our cricket better. It's as simple as that. But the financial gain will obviously help that. It, it's it's really interesting that you, you've had such a successful career at this time because I just urge England supporters to think back to England's last tour and remember the pitches that that series was played on. Now, you didn't complain about them at all, but they were tough for fast bowlers. Uh, and and you know you that's that's basically what you've had to put up with for most of your career, isn't it? Yeah, I've had to do that. So it's not good, but we're accustomed. So why why worry about it? Just go out there and do the work. And I've done it for all my career. I've played on in the subcontinent. I've played wherever else in the world. I've played. I've turned up. I've put my best foot forward. But sometimes you know that things can be better. You know things can be better and. If you look at the makeup of the West Indies team, you had Jason Holder, who's a top 10 fast bowler for a period of years. Myself, who's been a top 10 for a period of years. Shannon Gilbert had a good couple of years for the West Indies. And then we had the Alzaris and then the Jalen Seals coming in. So we've always had a very decent core from attack of fast bowlers. We've never really developed a spinner, a match winning spinner. We've had Cornwall. Warwick Khan has played a bit. Moti's in now. Before that, it was Ben, Bishu, and Shillingford. So we've had decent spinners, but we, we, we haven't had a match, match winning spinner really in our team. So therefore, you should be focusing your cricket on developing fast bowlers because fast bowlers have won a lot of matches for the West Indies in the last decade. So develop the fast bowlers, create better pitches, and then bring the life back in the cricket. You don't want to be bowling spin in the first hour in the first class game. And that's what's happening in the Caribbean right now. And it's not, it's very disheartening, man. It's not, it's not good for cricket and not the development of cricketers going forward. Is, is the raw talent still there at a, at a sort of base level at the, um, you know, kids level? There's that famous story, isn't there, of the, the three W's all born within what, uh, 18 months of each other, delivered by the same midwife, apparently, within, <laughs> within a mile or so. I just, uh, an incredible level of talent from Barbados in those years and actually sustained for a very, very long time. Was that freakish or do you think that that's still there and just needs nurturing, encouraging? Yeah, I, yeah, it's still there. It, it's still there. There are a lot of cricketers home that, that, that can definitely play a high level of cricket for the West Indies. Um, but as I said, they need nurturing. They don't have much opportunities. The cricket, the level of cricket in the Caribbean is just not that high enough in order to develop more. And that's why I said the structure needs to change. I, I personally believe, people will probably disagree with me, I personally believe that Barbados cricket team can put two first-class teams out right now and they will challenge for the, the title. I think a lot of guys don't get into the first team. They sit on the bench and they're quality players. So, so it's like, what are we doing? What are we, what are we going to do to help make a bigger pool of players? If you get more guys challenging, for West Indies um, selection, then you're going to get more challenging cricket, more 
more at, at Sunday cricket, guys will develop faster. So the structure needs to change. I don't know what needs to be done, what who needs to talk to who, but I think it's about time now that we really focus on developing our cricket in a different way. Well said. Those comments are going to play really well in Jamaica and Trinidad, aren't they? About two Barbados <laughs> side. I think I would turn off your notifications for a little while. <laughs> I remember. Um, I, right. The, the second question was Cody Ambrose or Courtney? Oh Moore. yeah, Cody or Courtney. That's tough. I can't. I can't separate them. I can't separate them. I have to go to both. I have to go with both. I'm sorry. Wise. I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you. I do remember. I remember I, I, this. I might be making this up, but I remember kind of reading about a, a chat between Sobers and Tendulkar, and Tendulkar asked Sobers like, "How do you, how do you produce so many Test cricketers like from Barbados with such a small like population?" And Sobers' answer was, "Because if we have a good player, we know about them. It was just there's no there's no one like slipping through the gap for the nets, mm. and that may be true, may not be true. But I always thought it was quite interesting in terms of the contrast between kind of an island." versus kind of the scale of India. Right, we're going to move on to a couple more questions before we wrap up the show. Uh, first things first, there is Nick. There's some stuff happening with the BBC and the county streams. It's relevant to how kind of basically the broadcasting future of the sport. Uh, I tried to find out about this, but you're a much better journalist than I am. So you actually know more, way more than I do. So I, that's all I've got. Nick, please take it away. Uh, if, this point, this might be slightly granular, and and I think it's maybe a little bit industry facing, but also quite important. I think in terms of how people hear county cricket these days, um, I think the community that that use BBC Local Radio and the streams and stuff that, that is a massive market and and one that's uh you know that cherishes that service and i think it's worth flagging that, that that deal comes to an end at the end of the year um currently counties have a hybrid of streams and bbc local and internal um, but they will have the option to and i think it is likely that they potentially go to a, a full model where all counties use in-house teams now that's a slightly interesting point given that some already have and and Cam, you're a beneficiary of of of, of that indeed. Right, um, indeed. But there are some that that haven't and still use the, the BBC local radio uh, aligned with the streams, and there's the options to go in in house. Now, what that future then looks like for BBC local radio commentary? Obviously, we know the BBC's local radio services undergoing cuts. We know that their funding model is going to be changing in a, in a couple of years. And how does that all marry together, I think, is is really interesting. I say it might sound a little bit granular, but actually a lot of people use these services and a lot of cricket journalists, a lot of the cricketers journalists were featured on the on the airwaves during the last round of matches. Uh, I think it's interesting the direction of travel we're going with that. And so I think it's one to certainly monitor in terms of whether that deal gets renewed, what the deal looks like going forward, and really the future of county cricket radio coverage um i think is, is is at stake here so i think something really interesting to to monitor going forward and something that really uh, i've been i've been looking at and sort of came to came to head over the last round where we had so many of our own journalists um commentating on 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 elements of uh, of the last round there's also more change out of next season by the time you might people might be listening to this the announcement of the eight women's regional teams may have been made there's reports of what teams what counties have Got those teams at the moment. We'll cover that in great detail going in the future. Nick Friend has written several pieces over the winter, kind of really getting into the details and speaking to dozens of players about what they think is the future of the women's game in this country. And George, to finish on a really cheery note, I'm going to give you one whole minute to solve the entirety of England's financial cricketing crisis. Uh, Gloucestershire posted 1.2 million losses this week. Uh, Leicestershire, 440,000. What's the answer? Well, the short term answer is they're going to sell the hundred, isn't it? So, oh yeah, they they. Oh, yeah. I mean, they they did tell the uh, county chairs, I think it was this week. I mean, the sums are enormous, uh, but they, they they're telling it's them a lot of money. they're going to be giving them between. I think they told them between three hundred and fifty and five hundred million pounds. That's that's the, the ECB told them this uh, week. Uh, I'm sold. Sell it. I <laughs> King face, a jerk forward. <laughs> thinking, you could build an indoor centre for Play that. 
Well, a couple of Indra Sendai. <laughs> yeah, because the Sky <laughs> Four Barbados like team. Twenty for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think that in the short term, some of the some of their problems uh, might be, you know, that that will be enough to help Worcestershire build a new ground for Gloucestershire to build a new ground for even Warwickshire to pay off their debts uh, and, and redevelop. So uh, there's um, that's the short term. Uh, long term, you've sold August. That's going to come back to bite. But, you know, we, we seem to be a culture that sells today, worries about it in 10 years' time. Uh, the people who are buying and spending that sort of money, they're going to want something for it. They're not just yeah. going to be giving the money and being really pleased that Worcestershire don't have to play in a floodplain. Former county of Kemars, of course, a long time ago. In fact, I bet you you'll have so, he'll have something over Jason Holder here. Jason will have left Worcestershire, having been there for six weeks or something, having never played at New Road. Yeah. All away games. Oh, no, well, there are uh, home games even are in Kidderminster because they're flooded. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it's yeah, slightly. Yeah, uh, it'll yeah. be a quiz question in years to come, maybe. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so so that is the short term, uh, uh, maybe even medium term solution, and you can understand, can't you, why county executives are so excited by the prospect of the hundred. But I say again, the people buying it will want something for it, and it, well, it, 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 it it's a huge watershed moment in in our sport. Um, what's, what's the saying? You can only you can only sell the golden goose once, and yeah, well. Sounds like it's going for 500 million. And um, I'd, I'd take 500 million. I'm, I'm a short term thinking kind of guy, George. I'll take my 500 million and run away. Um, yeah. Anyway, nobody covers county cricket like the cricketer. That is it for this week. And you can get access to our coverage of all 18 teams online from as little as £3.99 a month. Our own top team of county champions have now won the outstanding online coverage of domestic cricket prize at the ECB Domestic Cricket Journalism Awards for six years running so you don't have to take our word for it just click in the show notes to subscribe thank you very much to Kima for joining us this week thank you very much to George for solving the entirety of uh, England's problems Kima solved the Caribbean's problem we've done a lot this week we've solved a lot of big problems <laughs> and Nick has set up the future of kind of of the broadcasting world uh, I've been Cameron thank you very much to George Nick and Kima for joining us and we'll catch you next week cheers